we're going to go through a little of this quagmire uh, on this challenging disorder. Here's where I work. Here are my disclosures. I already disclosed that I'm an adult epileptologist, but I do have three kids and I do see a lot of uh, patients transition from uh, pediatric units over to our facility. So let me start out by saying that functional symptoms are ubiquitous in every area of medicine uh, and certainly in neurology. In neurology, we have the functional seizures that have also been called psychogenic non-epileptic uh, seizures or uh, functional attacks, functional syncope, sensory weakness, movement, cognitive uh, disorder, pain, and dizziness. And um, everyone experiences functional symptoms. You and I do, it's very common, uh, children do. And what we're gonna talk about today is the neurologic form, uh, which we call functional neurologic disorder. The epidemiology uh, is more focused on adults and it's not uh, perfect. A lot of this literature is old but the annual incidence is about four to 12 per 100,000, population prevalence of 50 per 100,000. And if you look at new visits to an ambulatory neurology clinic, and again, this is from the adult literature, about 30% have unexplained uh, symptoms, and of those, about almost 20% are F and D. If you look in subspecialty syncope clinics with cardiologists, about 5% of functional syncope, and um, in those patients with comorbid neurologic disorders, such as epilepsy in subspecialty clinics or in Parkinson clinics, more than 20% have functional neurologic disorder co-occurring. If you look specifically in our epilepsy monitoring units, it goes up higher um, depending on, on, uh, on the units, but 20 to 50%. With the female preponderance, three to one in most populations, Common age groups are adolescents, which is, I guess, why I'm invited here to midlife. And uh, you can see it in children, usually not lower than six years of age, and in the elderly, where the ratio may be a little bit more equal with, uh, uh, with sex. The burden is really quite high, and you've been talking about stigma and all these other things in your wonderful, timely conference. Healthcare utilization is costly between medications, tests, admissions, uh, many of these things that uh, may not even have been needed if the correct diagnosis was made, emergency department visits, ICU um, settings, and for this medically unexplained symptoms, which is a terrible term, uh, about $256 billion are spent uh, with F and D being responsible about 1.2 billion in adults and about 88 million for pediatrics. There's lower rates of employment, lower quality of life, um, can be uh, often worse than other neurologic disorders. Uh, the stigma of functional seizures is worse than epileptic seizures. The caregiver burden for uh, parents that are taking care of a child with uh, functional seizures is similar to epilepsy. And there's a, a newer literature coming through that there's an increased risk of death at the standard mortality ratio 2.5 times higher than general population. Now, it's not specifically for the functional symptom, but the functional symptom may be a symptom. It's often a symptom of other things in, the, in their world uh, that are problematic for, for them. We don't really study the effects on clinicians, families, the healthcare system, all of us here in this Zoom room. I imagine it's quite high from what I hear when I go around talking about this. And Mark Hallett, uh, about a decade ago, it said that this is a crisis for neurology. And the burden is also, uh, what do we call it? It's, it's burdensome because we don't really agree on terminology. And that's why I'm bringing you this term that I prefer and I think we need to go to, uh, to, to group these disorders together. I don't need to tell this group, we just heard about stigma. Our words really do matter. And uh, we've had some uh, webinars and conferences uh, 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 that I've led in the last couple of years during the pandemic when we switched to this virtual format uh, to discuss you know, what's in a name, what are the proper things when you name a disorder. Um, and one of them came up as it should not stigmatize the group. 
that you give the label to. And we have lack of unity if we don't go to a term that brings it together for the, the amount of patients that are affected by this disorder. And it's very confusing for patients, caregivers, and clinicians that are not in the know, which are still quite high. Um, it affects outcomes and trust in the diagnosis and explanation can affect the outcome. I'll just show you a, a picture from one of the talks uh, from the, the conference with this material that's still posted on the FND Society uh, website if you decide to become a member after my uh, talk. Um, but this pediatric um, psychiatrist in Australia spoke about children in particular and how language uh, can promote illness, promoting thoughts and worsen outcomes and actions are, are really important. So psycho, um, psychogenic uh, to kids is heard as you're mad or crazy. Pseudo uh, for everyone is you know false, you're faking it. And even just saying that these are not real seizures, what is that really implying? So just wanted to uh, pay a little attention to the words. And the reason that functional neurologic disorder has been chosen, and it's still not agreed by uh, everyone, is that this is really a, a systems problem with the brain. The definition that we like to use from this uh, publication that's just out uh, from a group of us who are, are speaking about uh, these topics in different realms, that there are neurologic disorders in which patients experience neurologic symptoms such as all those listed here. But the brain of patient with FND appears structurally normal, but functions incorrectly. And just very briefly, the terminology through the DSM-5 um, is that it, it's what I've already mentioned, but specifically wanted to show you that you do not need to have a psychological stressor anymore to have this disorder. In some patients, there is none to be found. So the objectives for my very brief romp with you today is to describe some of the latest strategies in diagnosing and communicating uh, FND, review models of care and treatments, and to discuss some special consideration in pediatric patients. And here's just a very famous painting that I like to at least start uh, out my talk, um, showing Charcot at the Salpetriere in the, 18, in the late 1800s uh, with a room full of uh, men, probably mostly uh, famous physicians uh, that you would recognize their names if I told you, with this famous patient Blanche, who is fainting. Um, and, and it's a psychogenic faint or functional syncope. This is a physician-centered approach, which I believe that we really still have to move away from much more. And neurology uh, still has a lot of this because we, we teach a lot and we like to diagnose, but the treatment is less of um, our comfort zone. I'm gonna show you this timeline that you'll see several times quickly um, that I borrowed from my colleague, Dr. Gaston Bezlet, who's a neuropsychiatrist at the Brigham with me. And uh, we start this treatment course with symptoms right when you actually meet the patient and take the history. I like this quote from Sir William Osler, listen to your patient, he or she is telling you the diagnosis. We think of this as something that's like, you know, we should all know, you know, from medical school or any of our training, for those of you who are, are practitioners in other areas, um, other than um, neurology, but uh, specifically for this disorder, the suddenness of the onset, often much more sudden than any neurologic um, uh, uh, based um, you know, structural disorder, we'll, we'll say, often with a trigger, although not always, and it can present um, with panic attacks. If you look carefully before the first presentation of FND, you may have seen uh, syncope or panic attacks in the history. May, it may be triggered by physical injury or procedure or even medication side effects. Prior similar presentations should at least be queried, maybe in other areas uh, other than seizure, if, if you're focusing on seizures and epilepsy. Prodromes, often uh, heart racing, sweating, shortness of breath, tremulous feelings, feeling of like fear, panic, often without the feeling of fear. So it doesn't feel like this is anxiety to patients. Dissociative symptoms are important to pick up. Uh, does the patient feel like they're, they're, they're not really there? The body may be there, but they weren't inside their body. We call that uh, depersonalization. And then comorbid medical disorders like irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, chronic pain are often, again, but not always present and can make it more challenging. 
patients may have been in our medical system and feel more stigmatized and have not felt comfortable with cl many clinicians. Comorbid neurological disorders, such as intellectual disability, which is very important, um, and uh, mild traumatic brain injury, epilepsy, as I mentioned before, migraine, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, et cetera. Comorbid psychiatric symptoms, such as uh, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and panic are not the only ones, but those are um, more common. I like this concept that we should, let me just pause this video here. Um, think of this more as a, a treat, helping patients know how we're making the diagnosis rather than keeping it you know, to ourselves, writing it in the chart, not telling patients. Uh, John Stone writes this wonderful article about a trick or treat. Um, so we need to show for this to be FND, inconsistency, variability, may be present in some circumstances and not in others, especially true for seizure patients. Positive signs, and I will show you what I mean by that, meaning it's not a rule out diagnosis where you've gone through a million tests, all of them are negative, and we say, I guess you, it's functional, uh, because that has really delayed treatment, um, and you'll see in a, in a few slides how that uh, uh, worsens prognosis. There are patterns uh, where weakness uh, it gives way, so the patient may be strong right at the onset, and then the pattern of weakness, whether it's not felt to be, uh, you know, anatomic uh, confirmed in the brain. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm not going to go into every picture here because I don't have a lot of time, but there are ways to show if you have a weakness, like a stroke-like presentation here, with the famous Hoover sign, tremors, um, showing you here a little bit about um, uh, in, in entrainment. Uh, so when the doctor asks the patient to touch the nose, you'll see that the tremor briefly stops and it's in training to the task at hand. So um, rel reliability of these signs for diagnosis uh, is variable. And I've listed here ones for FND in general that are quite um, specific and have the most sensitivity. I'm not going to go into all of these as well, because those in your room are probably not making the diagnosis in other areas of neurology, uh, since you're here uh, at an Epilepsy Foundation uh, mental health conference with Boston Medical Center. But it's really important when you're trying to uh, elicit things to avoid painful stimuli, and you'll find out in a few moments why it's specifically important uh, in general, but for these patients uh, who have been harmed uh, multiple times in our system. So coming now to where we work in the transient loss of consciousness, here it's called TLOC, but uh, we're talking about the ones that mimic seizures. We have epilepsy. Um, we have uh, the non-epileptic seizures, functional seizures, as I'm, I'm going to be calling them here, vasovagal syncope. And um, these three represent more than 90% of patients uh, coming in to see us. On the right, you'll see uh, the top multiple ones you might see more in children. Uh, you'll see this in the pediatric population. Adolescents, so the, the, the diagnosis varies depending on the age group, just like it does with epileptic seizures. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of these, but for the pediatric minded folks in the room, you know that it's different than uh, the adult world. And positive features that are transient are even more challenging uh, because catching them can be challenging. So, this is uh, how we obtain them in places where we have video EEG in hospitals available. It's considered the gold standard make this positive diagnosis, capturing an, epi uh, an episode where you'd have long duration, fluctuating course, asynchronous movements, side to side head body movements, closed eyes and memory recall as the ones with the most uh, highly specific and sensitive. However, um, in pediatrics, it may be that it's more common to have staring or what the, what's called dialectic episodes. Briefly, I'm just going to show you a video for those of you who are not familiar with this. Um, and oops, sorry. Um, go back and jump ahead with my. Uh, so um, here, this is a patient um, who is having an event. I'm not showing the EEG, but there's no ipsil correlate on the EEG. Um, this is consistent with the most frequent surgery type that presented with, 
but you need to confirm all typical events. And I'm showing you this because it's more prolonged. You still with us? Yeah, can you hear me? And so she was responsive during it. I didn't show um, most of her face here, although she's deceased, and I think the HIPAA uh, uh, laws don't apply here completely. But um, uh, you can see many of the features that I mentioned here. Sorry. Um, now, unfortunately, sometimes it is not, you're not able to get people into the epilepsy monitoring unit. For a variety of reasons: insurance won't pay. Uh, if it's an adult, they may have responsibilities, or the parent of the child may not be able to leave other children or other responsibilities. Um, a, a number of reasons the patient may not want to come in, or it may not be easy, especially in, um, in those that have uh, disabilities. So the, the smartphones, which are, as you can see here on the right, really just, uh, and this is an, a couple of years old, in the billions and, and located almost everywhere. Everyone has a, what we call a mini EMU right in their pocket. And just to show you very briefly that uh, this was a study that was done looking at convenient sample from eight uh, American medical centers of those that had you know, necessary video EEG uh, done, but also the uh, patients had videos of their uh, non-epileptic uh, events. And you can see by this bar graph on the bottom left that we do much better with the uh, uh, home video if the event has convulsive features, that is movements, than if it's non-convulsive. So in the pediatric population, it may be more challenging. And um, you can see that's uh, also true for uh, epilepsy. Um, and, uh, and that's just what I've stated here, that the accuracy has increased with motor signs. But if you combine this with the history and the physical exam, uh, the accuracy, the odds ratio goes up to five and a half. 5.5. So that's really helpful. And it does show uh, the diagnostic utility is better with experts because they took uh, residents, neurology residents that were not going into epilepsy as a career and, and showed that they were not as good as the experts. There's pitfalls here and challenges. Um, and I'm going to show you, uh, these are just some reasons, not all, may not, there may be lots more in the pediatric world but absence of psychiatric risk factors. Um, many clinicians look for these and don't think of the, uh, this disorder in patients who present sort of like you and I without um, any um, suspicion for other uh, difficulties. Big one here bolded, which I think is very important in pediatrics, not considering F and D with another neurologic disorder such as epilepsy. And I'm gonna show you an example of the same patient below. Incidental test, uh, sorry, lack of knowledge of the positive features to make this diagnosis or even that this diagnosis exists. An incidental uh, result comes into focus either on a scan or an EG. You have an adult male patient. You have infrequent events. Um, medicine was tried and it worked for a while. Reason for wrong diagnosis is a quick jump to conclusions based on risk factors without really having a broad enough differential. Failure to consider other medical or neurological cause, not using the positive signs, um, and diagnosing due to bizarre presentation that you've never seen before, or relying on tests alone. And very briefly, I think I don't need to tell this audience uh, that uh, this patient um, here, hopefully no one would mistake that this is a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Uh, this is the same admission. Uh, this patient came from another hospital where they were diagnosed and taken off their medications because all they captured were the frequent uh, functional seizures. And um, you can miss it if you don't have a broad enough diagnosis. So just to drill this point home, our tests can mislead. Um, and this has been reported over here on the left. I'm showing you what an epileptic spike looks like on the top part and what sort of a, a transient, you know, irregularity in the EEG that is not an epileptic spike that's often overread by uh, non-experts. This is uh, it's been called psychomotor variant, arrhythmic mid-temporal theta of drowsiness, and a wicket. So these are the most common overinterpretations that can lead to misdiagnosis. And I could show you a similar slide for MRI scans and other tests that confuse patients and that lead to a garden path that can take place very harmful of just more and more tests, more and more consults. 
Set expectations for your result when you're ordering a test. Let the patients and families know why we're ordering it. It may show some irregularity, uh, incidental finding, which I am you know, not going to be focusing on. It may be unrelated to your child's uh, disorder. And, and this is important. You know, what is the pretest probability before you even order the test? Because if you're ordering tests because you have no clue, it's often not going to help you. This is a complicated slide. I'm not going to go into all aspects on the slide because of the time constraints, but this is out of that Lancet article. I'm going to focus you that it's a complex model of what is going on um, and what happens in, in all disorders. There's predisposing factors that could be genetic. Here uh, on the left side, in, in kids' childhood adversity is more important than uh, history of sexual abuse, which is one of the more important ones in adults, but again, not the only one. Um, and comorbidities, which I've mentioned on previous slide, perpetuating factors, why they continue even after diagnosis, and the importance of really involving the family, and how this works in the brain. Uh, impaired sensory integration, integration coming up, possibly after injuries and amplification of symptoms, and that the brain is a predictor. Uh-oh, is this going to happen again? And we see this uh, all the time, but risk factors are not the cause. And, and please be mindful not to explain it as this is because you know your child has had this trauma or whatever. That is not an explanation. This is a brain disorder. This is a neuropsychiatric disorder. It lives between neurology and psychiatry. And here's a model I borrowed from Mark Pellet, um, who is an amazing neuromuscular expert who's brought this disorder now into the mainstream. Um, it's very simplistic, but the movement generation of the brain is normal. The brain's intention is what's abnormal, especially in the areas of limbic, uh, amygdala and other areas of emotion discontrol. Um, and this is a site for the biopsychosocial effects. You see here, we know that in all of medicine, there are multiple factors for every disorder. And the will, the patient is not aware that they have agency here. This feels involuntary to patients, even though it looks voluntary uh, to clinicians. And this is what our studies have been showing. I, again, there's multiple, and there's gonna be more and more publications on mechanism and how this happens. Patient says he cannot, it looks like he will not, but the truth is that the patient cannot will. This is a quote taken from the early 1900s by Sir James Paget. So let's again, come back to our uh, uh, treatment slide presentation. We get this wrong oftentimes, especially if we use this rule out and all the tests are normal. You can see here, good news, nothing's wrong. Everything checks out normal. And what is heard by our patients is like, oh, great. Uh, she thinks I'm crazy or I'm faking it. These are both uh, very unfortunate ways. And so we have to really be transparent. We should not blame the patient. We should believe the symptoms. Not believing sy symptoms is the way it gets uh, wrong. Not listening well, rushing the encounter, miscommunicating or not allowing two-way communication, searching for psychiatric or psychological trauma, not developing a report, not sharing the FND in the early differential ordering more and more tests and more medications and not educating about how to manage, only teaching this as a differential and saying, we're gonna diagnose and then adios. So, and not allowing follow-up. And neurologists are still uh, uh, not owning this in many spheres. And so the single biggest problem of communication, this is George Bernard Shaw, is the illusion that it's taken place. You know, we say something, but you know, what is the problem? What are we communicating when we present this disorder? It's a lot of implicit bias. We are all learning about this in other spheres for the last many years been very helpful with the Me Too movement, with all cultural biases. And there's really still no consensus on what to call the disorder. That's confusing and gives mixed messages. Uh, Bridget Milden in one of our conferences, who you probably know is uh, the head of FND Hope, said that, you know, we think you guys don't know what you're talking about when you keep using different terms and different doctors. So it's very important that uh, we recognize that what we say is understood. If, if you have a belief and that you're sort of conveying that with weird language, then patients understand that either you don't believe them or whatnot. Um, communicate to engage, not stigmatize. And that's why we're going to use brain terminology. You want to explain any abnormal tests and even pull it in so you can look at it and explain how you made the diagnosis using trauma-informed care principles. This audience probably knows them. I've listed them there. 
the challenge here is one size does not fit all, and there are many challenges here. Here's a particularly useful protocol. Do what we usually do when we give disorders. Validate. Uh, this is common. This is really happening. You are not faking it. I think if you don't say that, then that implicit implication with things like these are not real seizures can come up for certain clinicians and is problematic. Give it a label. I'm going to say that I like the F and D label, but uh, you have to use what you're comfortable with. Positive features um, and how you made that diagnosis, I think I showed you briefly. This is uh, one of many different analogies, and you can use one that's geared to your particular patients. So if it's a younger child or an adolescent, you may use a different analogy and you come up with your own. I like to say that uh, it's the brain's automatic response, like a reflex. Brain's automatic nervous system we know is involved with this heart racing, um, uh, even other things that we are seeing co-occur uh, tell us that. The immediate trigger is not often obvious. And so patients and their families get very confused because they might feel the best they've ever felt. It was a great weekend. Why did this happen? Why did it happen after the migraine was gone, for example? And we know that's true for migraines as well. Um, if they're computer savvy, then it's a software, not a hardware problem. There are effective treatments. It's a retraining of the brain by learning new skills. This is most taught uh, in psychotherapy. So we do have to mention that currently a lot of these skills, at least if you have the seizure variant, are used uh, by, uh, in, uh, in psychotherapy. But if patients only have uh, motor or movement, then directly sending to physical therapists and occupational therapists, as you'll shortly see, because they use a lot of the same techniques used in CBT. It's very important to integrate, integrate others in the child's and in uh, the adult's ecosystem. Uh, for example, school and life and other caregivers that may be helping them and saying, no, they're wrong, because that really is unhelpful. And setting expectations that this is going to take time. This is not just developed, even though it may have started three months ago or a year ago, this is how this your, your brain has been working in other realms. And uh, often we see it in strong and tough patients who push through adversity, like epilepsy, like uh, you know bullying and other things, and that um, they feel really strong and the stigma, you know, showing a sign of weakness really hinders them. So I like to point that out and um, uh, patient and family have to be involved. Just giving lip service to going to see someone uh, is not helpful. Uh, and then you really have to say, do you have any questions or concerns about what I've just said and see if they can repeat back? Because if you don't allow that, uh, you may not see this patient again because they're going to go somewhere else and, um, and, and find someone who that they can understand. I'm going to jump over engagement briefly to acute treatment phase. I'm running out of time here, uh, so I want to make sure that I uh, get to all pieces. This is just a model to show what CBT uses. Again, I'm not going to go into the details here. You should know about this is the biggest trial in, in UK. It's called dissociative seizures. Uh, did not pan out to be effective for seizure frequency, but probably in the UK, uh, too many of the clinicians involved are really good at uh, treating dissociative seizures or functional seizures, but all the ones circled in uh, sort of squared in red uh, were significant seizure bothersomeness and severity, seizure freedom uh, for a longer period of time, quality of life, uh, et cetera. And this is a good study to read if you're interested. Here's physical therapy for FMD, functional motor. And in red, you see these are the principles that are used uh, very importantly. Um, you know, we don't want to provide wheelchairs too early or, or canes or, or things like that. Um, we want to give people uh, an ability to practice in real life. So avoidance and things like that can be harmful. There's a lot of barriers here. I've bolded the ones uh, that apply to pediatrics in particular, um, but I'm sure there's others, but this was modified uh, from a, a book chapter um, by Sochek and others. And we have a lot of challenges with, with access to mental health services right now and with the busyness of our symptoms and the low infrastructure, especially now with hospitals. It's a team sport. And um, in here, I just wanted to show you that we really need to include, especially for pediatric schools, friends, and 
the points that came up at the stigma part of the conference of how do you do this is really important to help with. Um, uh, positive prognostic factors are on the right, negative on the left. I'm not going to read through them because of time, but I do want to point out that for pediatrics, the data looks better that um, you know, younger age of onset or uh, with the diagnosis can be helpful, although these patients may end up in other areas, other practices. They may just have stopped having the seizures. Um, and then a rapid initiation of appropriate treatment is really important. important. And I, I think that, um, I've already said this, I think that for adults, it's worse. I'm gonna show you um, one study shortly, but engaging patients in treatment um, is really critical um, because there's data coming out. And one of my fellows who's now an attending at Yale um, University showed that the adherence to treatment for this disorder drops off in a paltry fashion. They may make it to the neurologic team three quarters, but by the time they get into psychotherapy treatment, it's dropped off significantly and even more for completing treatment. So that's where neurologists really need to keep patients uh, engaged until they're ready for treatment, like we do with other disorders. We don't just say, oh, you're not taking your uh, diabetic medication. Well, goodbye, I can't help you. Education is critical. These are all of the different um, uh, websites that I'm sure that the EFNE will have posted. Um, I did want to really mention uh, uh, the, the, there was a study by Fred Wall that the pediatric population should know about in epilepsy just like a year or two ago, showing that time to treatment within 30 days in this pediatric group, more than capturing the actual episode really uh, correlated with good outcomes. And we fall short, uh, um, certainly in the adult world. So uh, waiting for the EMU, um, I know this is out of order, is really not always okay. So here are my take home uh, messages. FND is common, it's real, and it's debilitating. The history and rapport are critical to establishing diagnosis. Risk factors are not the cause. Positive symptoms and signs are necessary for diagnosis, not as a rule out. Minimize unnecessary testing and just moving them to other uh, consoles and especially uh, medications. The challenges exist around uh, dual diagnoses, especially in pediatrics. Patients may not have as much way, uh, way to, to describe what they're going through. The importance of non-stigmatizing language, I think I made pretty clearly. And there are evidence-based treatments that you need to, uh, to use early to improve outcomes. And we need to stick with our patients not just uh, to diagnose, but to remain within the treatment team. And with that, I just want to invite you all to become members, if you would like, of the FND Society. And uh, we had a beautiful meeting uh, in Boston in June, a uh, great showing. And the next meeting is in Verona. And I wanted to close uh, with this picture in a uh, painting by Sir Samuel Luke Fildes, which is, I think, a more patient-centered approach and not the usual physician-centered approach. And I love this quote by Sir Peabody, Sir Francis Peabody, uh, spoken in a lecture at Harvard in 1926, that the secret in the care of the patient is caring for the patient.